Good evening. For this program, we're going to go right into deep space. But first of all, two very interesting items of news. Liquid water on Mars sounds rather unlikely. The Martian air is so thin, water will evaporate. Nevertheless, we know there's ice there. There's a picture of Mars. You can see the polar cap at the bottom. And ice is quite definitely concentrated in the other poles. But now there's a suggestion there may be water inside some of the craters. This picture was taken in 1998. We showed it a year later. See there, gully, it's like the running water, pooling at the bottom of the crater. Indication now, this may be liquid water. If so, the implications are very striking indeed. Well, we haven't yet got the full information. Watch our Sky at Night website, and we'll keep you posted. And of course, we'll give you all the latest news in our next program. Then, the Compton satellite. One of our most successful satellites came to the end of its career, had to be brought down safely, and on June the 4th was brought down in the Pacific. So, goodbye Compton, it had done its work very well indeed. And now, on to our main theme. A couple of years ago, I turned my telescope toward the double cluster in Perseus, the sword handle. And there they are, two lovely open clusters, 7,000 light years away, in the same telescopic field. And they really are most impressive. Now, the official catalogue number is NGC 869. NGC stands for New General Catalogue, even though it's not new now, drawn up over a hundred years ago. There are older catalogues, and by far the most famous catalogue of clusters and nebulae was drawn up way back in 1781 by the French astronomer Charles Messier, and there he is. But ironically, Messier was not at all interested in clusters or nebulae. He was a comet hunter, and he kept on being deceived by things that looked like comets and weren't. And believe me, a cluster or a nebula can look very like a faint, tailless comet. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a picture I took of Halley's Comet, the last time it came round in 1986. There's the comet to the left, and to the top right is the globular cluster Omega Centauri, and they do look very alike. And Messier kept on wasting time by finding that he had to eliminate and eventually he lost patience and decided to draw up his own catalogue of over a hundred clusters and nebulae merely as objects to avoid. Ironically, everyone now uses Messier's catalogue and very few people remember his comets. Now there it is. So let's have a look now at one or two of the famous objects in Messier's list, beginning with probably the most famous of all, Messier 31, the Great Spiral in Andromeda. An awesome object. There's the square of Pegasus, the Andromeda leading away from that. And there is a position of M31. You can just see it with the naked eye. And there's a picture taken with a large telescope. It is a huge spiral galaxy, almost edge onto us, and more than two million light years away, and containing more stars than our own galaxy. Let's look now at Messier's number 57, the Ring Nebula. And this is the constellation of Lyra, the lyre or harp, marked by the brilliant blue star Vega, almost overhead in summer evenings. And there it is M57. I've never seen it with binoculars. Some people say they can. A small telescope shows it. as a small, luminous cycle ring with a faint star in the middle. And here's a picture taken with a Hubble telescope showing it in all its glory. And you know what it is? It's called a planetary nebula. Not a good name. It's not a nebula, not a planet. It's an old star that's thrown away its outer layers. And there are plenty of these planetaries in the sky. Now, in Messier's catalogue, the first entry, appropriately, was Messier 1, M1, in the constellation of Taurus. Uh, there's Aldebaran with the higher Ds, and there is M1, near the third magnitude star, Zeta Tauri. You can see it with powerful binoculars, and telescopically, well, that picture was taken there with the VLT, or Very Large Telescope, in Chile, and here the lovely Hubble picture showing immense detail inside. And you know what it is? It's the wreck of a supernova. A brilliant star seen to flare up in the year 1054, and becoming temporarily bright on any star in the sky, visible in broad daylight, and then faded away again. The total destruction of a very massive star, and very few supernovae have been seen in our galaxy since then. So that's the Crab Nebula M1. And then, I suppose, the most famous of all, Messier 42 in Oran. Not on view now, above the horizon, only in daylight. It's a winter thing, but most people know Oran, the belt, and the gleaming sword, and in the sword is M42, and this is a stellar nursery. That picture taken by Commander Hatfield, never in the middle there, on a small scale, and here, a lovely picture taken by David Malin. 
and that is a stellar nursery more than 1,500 light years away inside which new stars are being born. And something like 5,000 million years ago, our sun was born inside a nebula of precisely that kind. Different again, a globular cluster, M13, Messier 13 in Hercules, and this is a huge symmetrical system containing more than a million stars on the fringe of our galaxy. You can just about see it with the naked eye between the stars Zeta and Eta Herculis, and binoculars show it well. And I wonder, if we lived on a planet going on a star inside a globular cluster, our night sky would indeed be magnificent. There are many naked eye stars brighter than Venus, and many others will be red, because globular clusters are very ancient things. Now, all those are in Messier. But what's not there? Well, the Hyades, for example. There they are, round our Debaran. Now, the Hyades are not in Messier. He couldn't possibly mistake them for a comet. And, of course, the same applies to the sword handle in Perseus. You can't mistake that for a comet either, and therefore Messier wasn't interested. A couple of years ago, I was sitting in my study and suddenly an idea came to me. Messier's catalogue is incomplete. He left out those things he couldn't compete with the comets, and also he lived in France and couldn't see things in the far south. And therefore there are many bright clusters and nebulae that are not in Messier and are quite often neglected by amateur observers. Why not catalogue those when I have a new catalogue omitting all the Messier objects. So I began to compile one, and in a couple of hours I'd done it. Now, what to call it? Well, Moore and Messier begin with M, couldn't use that, but my surname is actually a double barrel one, Caldwell Moore, so I used C, and called it the Caldwell Catalogue. I drew it up, and uh, well, frankly, <laughs> I didn't take it very seriously. I sent it into the American periodic called Sky and Telescope, and to my great surprise, they took it up, and um, everyone now seemed to use it, which really did surprise me considerably. So, one of the bits about the Caldwell Catalogue. First of all, I don't have on some kind of order. Messier's order is quite random, of course. Well, I decided to begin in the far north and then go right through to the far south. And so far, I have a regular, a regular sequence. So I began with C1, an open cluster in Cepheus, declination over 82 degrees. There it is. A photograph taken specially for us by Bob Forrest, I must say, at Hartford. And then going right the way down to a faint object in, in Chameleon, uh, near the South Pole. That's a planetary nebula, a complete sequence down. Uh, declination, well, I'm just going to that, I suppose. You see, the sky, declination, is the equivalent of latitude. Therefore, the North Pole is declination 90 North, and the South Pole, declination 90 South. I live in Solsi, declination 51 degrees North. Take 51 away from 90, and you get 39. Therefore, from my observatory, in theory, I can see down to declination 39 degrees South. Actually, not quite that. You can't see near the horizon, but basically I can. Therefore, some of it I can see, and some that I can't. For example, in my list, I can quite definitely get C66 in Hydra. Declination there, minus 26. 67 in Fornax, just about minus 30. 68 Corona Australis, minus 39. No, not a hope. Therefore, no one could go through and see all the Caldwell objects in one night. You can do it with the Messier, you can't with Caldwell, even if you live right on the equator of Singapore. However, there are many of these things that are within range, and I think all the Caldwell rockets can be seen with a small telescope, rather like this lovely little Max Utah telescope here. That will show them all. So let's now go through, and I'll give you one or two of my favorite Caldwell objects. Begin with C6. This is the Cat's Eye Nebula, a planetary nebula. This picture is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope and shows intricate structure. And there in the middle, you see the central star that has thrown off all this dust and gas. Of course, a small telescope shows the nebula. To see the central star, something larger, I can just about get it with my own fitting this telescope, but it's quite faint. To find it in Draco the Dragon, not hard to find at all. Uh, there it is, you can see. And uh, it's so far north, but over here, it never actually sets. Something very different, C20, the North America Nebula in Cygnus. And here it is, a bright nebula. See the outline of North America with the Gulf of Mexico, because it turned itself sideways, of course. And there near the top, the bright star Deneb. Now, this is a bright nebula, and in fact, not all that easy to find immediately. Binoculars are probably the best. It covers a large area, therefore, telescopes aren't much use. But you'll find it right in Cygnus, the Swan. There it is. There's Deneb. And there is the North American Nebula. Certainly very well worth finding. We haven't had a galaxy yet, so let's go now to C23. 
This is an Ajon galaxy in Andromeda, although not associated with M31. And the small telescope shows this streak there. A larger telescope will show that central condensation. And believe me, uh, our galaxy, seen Ajon, might look rather like that. Not very hard to find in Andromeda. There it is, near the third magnitude star, Gamma Andromeda. And Gamma itself is a rather nice double, so have a look at that too. Now, a different one, C39, one of my very favorites. This is a planetary. This is the Eskimo Nebula. You can understand why some people call it the Clown Face Nebula. You can see there, great structure in it. Uh, again, easy to see as a small patch in the constellation of Gemini, near the famous star Delta Geminorum. So you'll find the Eskimo Nebula there. Now, a barred spiral, this time C44. And these barred spiral are interesting things. Uh, telescope there shows the streak, and the photographs show, extending from the end of the streak, you have there these strange parts of spiral bars. And that one is a long way away, a hundred million light years. See that it was a hundred million years ago. And again, not hard to find. Small telescope shows it. And there it is in Pegasus, quite near the third magnitude star, Mark App, or Alpha Pegasi. Something more difficult, the famous Rosette Nebula in Monotherus, the unicorn, near Orion. And this picture looks very impressive. And it is impressive, but of course, in fact, it's not quite so easy to locate as you might imagine. It covers a large area, more than a degree, and the surface brightness is rather low. Therefore, probably, the best way to find it is by using binoculars, and a certainly a nebular filter will help, and you do need a very dark sky to find C49. Now for C55, the Saturn Nebula. This photograph, again, taken special for us by Bob Forrest down at Hertfordshire. This is a planetary nebula. You can just see the appendages there looking rather like Saturn's rings, and that's why Lord Ross called it that. And this picture, of course, shows great detail. You can see up the small telescope, but you can locate it. It's in the constellation of Aquarius, fairly bright, and uh, binoculars will show it. Also in Aquarius, the Helix Nebula, C63, this is another planetary, and actually, the brightest of all the planetaries, brighter than the big nebula in Lyra, and there a black and white picture, and this Hubble picture shows it in all its glory. And that's one of the closest of the planetaries, less than 500 light years away. And you will find it easily with binoculars, again, uh, in Aquarius, near the borders of the Capricornus. Next, C65, the Sculptor Galaxy. And a declaration minus 25, you can see that from here. There's a small-scale picture. You can see the dark rift in the middle. And this is taken with the AAT in Australia. And this lovely picture with the Hubble Space Telescope. This is one of the very finest of the Edgeron galaxies. A small telescope shows it. And that picture, see the amazing structure in this outer edge. You'll find it near the star Beta Ceti, and the binoculars show it quite distinctly. So it's probably one of the finest galaxies in the entire sky. And the southerners call that their answer to M31. Now, so far, We've been dealing with things you can see from here. Let's now go much further south, things you can't see from here, because they never rise. And one of them is interesting, C77, this is Centaurus A, the Centaurus galaxy, a well-known radio source, a compound thing, you see there, the dark band crossing it, and this color photograph brings it back really well. you see it there quite clearly. And that is one of the most famous radio sources in the entire sky, and the integral structure comes out very well indeed. That's a binocular object, and even a four-inch telescope will show the dark rift there, and quite easy to locate in Centaurus, but say just too far south to be seen from here. Also in Centaurus, further south, is the finest globular cluster in the entire sky, Omega Centauri, 17,000 light years away, a huge system made of more than a million stars, a small-scale view there, and look at this, the stars there closely packed near the middle. Imagine the view if we lived on a planet going on the star in the middle of Omega Centauri. Would be, our dark skies would be not dark at all, and many of those stars would be red because globular clusters are very ancient things, and the leading stars are, in general, old red, su old red supergiants. I may say, Omega Centauri was seen by Flamsteed, and he gave it a Greek letter, and didn't realize it was anything but an ordinary nebulous star. You can find it quite easily. At the bottom of the chart, you see the two pointers to the Southern Cross, Alpha and Beta Centauri, Above them, the bright second magnitude star, Gamma Centauri, and above that you see Omega. Now, on to C92, the Eta Cardini Nebula in the keel of the old ship. And there's a small field picture, more stars shown here, and here the nebula in all its glory. Associated with the erratic variable star, Eta Cardini, 
which 150 years ago was the brightest star in the entire sky apart from Sirius, and is now on the fringe of naked eye vi visibility. And that is a very massive, unstable star, which will go up soon as a supernova. And there the Ithacarone, I say again, too far south to be seen from here. Now to the Southern Cross and C94, Capricusis, or the Jewel Box, in my view, the loveliest cluster in the entire sky. Small serial picture here, but look at these colours as shown in this photograph. Most of them are hot and white, and one red supertarant in the middle. And it was Sir John Herschel who said it gave the impression of a glorious cluster of jewels. You can see it with the naked eye just about, but not going to show the patch. In the Southern Cross, the other star, Beta Crucis. Believe me, the jewel box is well worth looking at. Now, something quite different. I think you can't see at all. This is C99, the coal sack. Again, on the Southern Cross. There it is. You can see there a huge mass of dark dust and gas, shutting out the light of the stars beyond. Telescopes do show one or two stars there. There are foreground stars in between the coal sack and ourselves. There are other dark nebulae in the sky, but the coal sack is certainly the most impressive of them. And you'll find it again in the Southern Cross, the other star, Beta Crucis. We have our Pleiades. In the Southern Hemisphere, they have what they call the Southern Pleiades, C-102, round the star Theta Carini, again in the keel of the ship. And there's a picture. Most of those stars are hot and bluish-white. And this is one of the very nearest of the open clusters, less than 500 light years away. And you'll find it some way away from the Southern Cross. Now, onto the large cloud of Magellan, the nearest of the big external galaxies, 170,000 light years away in the far south. And there we find the massive Tarantula Nebula, C103. And there it is, a huge mass of dust and glowing gas. And if that was close to us at the Orion Nebula, it would cast shadows. Look at the immense amount of detail there. Again, very easy to find. You can't miss the LMC, and we're not going to show the Tarantula very well indeed. And finally, my last of my choices, C106, the globular cluster, 47 Tucani, in the constellation of Tucan of the Tucan, and there's a small scale view, and with a greater magnification, you see it is a huge system, more than a million stars, and again, the brightest cluster in the sky, apart from Omega Centauri, and in some ways, I think 47 is the more spectacular, is almost silhouetted against the small cloud of Magellan, and the two make the most amazing contrast. So there we have 47 Tucani, silhouetted against the small cloud of Magellan. Well, those are just some of the 109 Caldwell objects, and I hope you'll enjoy looking at them. And if you do take photographs or send us drawings, we'll put them on our Sky at Night website, number of course, www.bbc.co.uk Sky at Night, and also look at CFAX, page 620. There's plenty to see there, and I hope you'll enjoy learning about among the Caldwell objects. So until next month, Good night. I've always been particularly interested in the planet Mars. From mountains, valleys, the largest volcano in the entire solar system. I would love to go to Mars. We a very massive rocket to launch for me, I'm afraid. The first man on Mars may be alive now. He may be listening into this program. I present my favorite planet. Everything you need to know about Mars and more. A night on Mars, tomorrow from 8 on BBC Knowledge, the new factual channel for digital viewers. Travel through space and time with BBC Online's Solar System Guide at bbc.co.uk slash science.